Hi, um, I'm Alex. Hi, I'm Jenny. Uh, we are developers at the Government Digital Service in the UK. We work on the single domain for government, gov.uk. Um, and today we're going to talk to you a bit about it. I'm going to talk about where the website came from, how it began, and how we work on it day to day. And then Jenny's going to talk about how we moved all of the old government websites onto one single domain. So to begin at the very beginning, this is how the government website looked in 2010 or 2011. So it was, had a reputation of not being massively easy to use. Um, and if you think about the technology that we were all using in 2010 or 2011, um, it's pretty clear from using this that the government wasn't really keeping up with uh, the rate of change of mainstream consumer technology. So there was a small team that was put together to create a vision for what a government website could look like. And it was a small cross-functional team, and they came up with an alpha which they made in about three months. And this was really designed to make people sit up and think what government could do with a website. Um, at the same time that they were doing that, they had some design principles. So these are not just principles for designing, they're principles for creating great digital services. So they're things like, right up at the top, the most important is start with needs. Um, the asterisk there is user needs, not government needs because government had always been good at thinking about what it wanted, but not good about thinking what people who interacted with government wanted. Um, so number five on the list, iterate then iterate again, is an indication that things are never finished, really, and they're, ne they're certainly never created finished. They always require work to keep going. So the team that was working on the alpha shipped the live website, that became the single domain for government. Um, and we moved all of the old government websites onto one single domain, um, made it easier for people to find things, easier to use. And that brings us to where we are today. So gov.uk is the single website for government. Um, it's the place that citizens visit if they need something from government. And it's the place that every government department publishes to. So I want to talk a bit about how we work on gov.uk and sort of how we go about our day-to-day -day work. So that 10th design principle that I showed you on the list is make things open, it makes things better. And we try to follow that as much as we can on gov.uk. So our roadmap is a public Trello board. Anyone can visit this. And we've got uh, things that we're doing, things that we're going to be doing in the future. And also on the right-hand side, things that we said that we're not doing right now at least. Um, but more interestingly for the people here probably, all of our code, or well, as much of our code as we can publish, is public on github.com. Um, and we do that for a few reasons. Partly it's because we get to make pull requests like this when we removed all of the branding from gov.uk. And this is really nice because it's got a load of comments on pe of people saying how great the website is. Uh, I think this is amazing because this is people on GitHub getting excited about the launch of a government website, which is just not something that ever could have happened before. There are cat GIFs and memes, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, and this never would have happened with DirectGov, the old site. This image at the bottom here is 3 a.m. in the morning in October 2012 when the old orange website switched over to the new one. Um, that was the team that made the change to do that. And that's a great reason for making our stuff public. It's not that great. Um, much more importantly is stuff like this. This is a pull request from a digital agency that was doing some work for a different part of government. So they were making use of one of our core applications on GovUK. And they needed to change it to support a PostgreSQL database. Um, this wasn't something that we needed. It was something that we thought about doing at some point in the future, but it wasn't a priority for us. Uh, but because all of our code is public on gov.uk, on GitHub, um, they were able to, without having to jump through any hoops, make this change. Um, and with a bit of backwards and forwards on the pull request with review from us, we were able to get this change merged into our public repo. 
So um, this is a great example for making our code public. We make a bit of a distinction between the things that we publish. So everything that we have on GitHub is open source licensed, but we don't use the term open source to describe what we do. We say coding in the open instead. And we say that because we don't have the resources to foster a community around what we're doing. And also, we're not certain that fostering a community around what we're doing is the most useful thing. A lot of our code is very specific to the problems that we're trying to solve. There are some things that we've extracted, um, so small parts which we know are useful and reusable, and we do publish those as supported open source, but we don't do it for everything. Um, and then the stuff that we can't publish, um, for that we use GitHub Enterprise, which has been talked about today. These are, uh, um, in this pull request, some of our actual production passwords encrypted in our GitHub repo with GPG. So I hope GPG works. Um, so hopefully you're getting the idea that we're really big fans of version control. Um, we really like using Git and GitHub for all of our work. But we use Git in a way that's a little bit different to some other people. Um, this is a change that one of our developers made to our web server config. Um, this is changing the SSL, so security ciphers that are in use on the config. Um, and this change by itself doesn't really mean anything at all, um, at least not to me just looking at this diff. And in places that I've worked before and maybe places that you've worked before, the change in the Git repo might have looked like this. And this is a seven character change from March 2014. And there's no useful information in the commit message at all. Um, so fortunately, the actual change in our repository looks more like this. Um, this is the commit message that went along with that change. And it explains in a huge amount of detail the state of the system before the change was made and afterwards and the reason for the change and all of the context and thinking that has gone into it. And we find this really valuable, um, especially for changes that are two years old, and especially in this case, because this developer doesn't work on gov.uk anymore. So it's not like we can go and ask them what they were thinking when they made this change. Um, yeah, so we think not every commit, mes ha commit message has to be this long, but every commit message, we think, has to adequately explain what it's doing and why it's doing it. And so we have a Git style guide, um, which explains how we like our commit messages to be formatted. Um, and as you might expect, that's in a public repo on our GitHub account. Um, so we make huge use of pull requests um, as part of our flow for reviewing code and getting it into production. But we put a lot of work into our commits as well. Um, and we do that for a few reasons. Partly and probably most obviously because um, you don't need an internet connection to see your commits. But if all of the context was on the GitHub uh, pull request, then you'd be relying on being able to access that to see what's going on. But also, more fundamentally, we do that because government has an interesting history of dealing with vendor lock-in. And we're very conscious that if we had to stop using GitHub for whatever reason, we would want to be able to take the context of our repository with us. Um, so we think it's really important to store that information with the code. And that doesn't mean that we don't build things on top of GitHub. Um, so like I said, we make huge use of pull requests uh, for getting our work done. And we've built stuff to enable us to do that. So this is a project we have. Um, which shows open pull requests against our repositories. Every team has a, or pretty much every team has a monitor which shows the pull requests that they need to review, how long they've been open, and what the state of them is. Um, <clears throat> this is a project that makes use of branches that we push to GitHub during our deployment process to show which applications haven't been deployed recently to production, which applications are quite out of date. Um, and this is a project which jumps into our Slack channels and reminds our teams which things need to be deployed. 
So that's a bit about how we work on gov.uk. Um, so trying to make things as open as possible, always iterating on our product, but also putting a lot of effort into our tools as well. So now I'm going to hand over to Jenny. So um, Alex has talked about how we build GovUK, and I'm going to talk about the second part of our talk title, the not breaking the web part. So as Alex said, GovUK launched in October 2012, and it replaced two earlier central government websites called DirectGov, which was that orange one, and BusinessLink, which was blue. And GovUK had actually been on our online for some time before that in beta, and on launch night, um, what actually changed was that those two old websites were redirected to GovUK, and that's what those people in the office in the middle of the night cheering were celebrating. Um, GovUK became the single website to find government content at that time. And then over the next six months or so after that, the 24 main government departments uh, also started publishing on GovUK, and their sites were redirected. And then over the next year and a half or so, but up until the end of 2014, over 300 other government organizations also moved their publishing onto GovUK, and we redirected their old sites to GovUK. So this process is what we mean by transition. Um, it's government organizations starting to publish on GovUK and their old sites being redirected to that new content on GovUK. A guiding principle of GovUK is that users shouldn't have to understand the internal structure of government in order to be able to interact with it or to find the information that they're looking for. So this image that Alex showed you earlier of all of these different department websites, before transition, if you wanted to find out something that the government was doing or their policy on something, you might have to know which department was responsible for that policy, navigate your way around all these differently structured websites to find what you needed because the content wasn't all in one place and it wasn't structured and organized around user needs or written with user needs in mind. Um, there are some areas of responsibility that cross multiple departments, such as the government's policy on Afghanistan. It's made by multiple departments who are all involved in different aspects. There's a list of them in the middle of the page there. Um, and now there's just one page on GovUK for this policy, uh, and it is maintained by all of these departments, and that page lists all of the publications from each department, so you can see them all together in one place, but the responsibilities are still clear, if you want to understand that. Our first design principle from that list that Alex showed you is start with needs, user needs, not government needs. So in the context of transition, we meant by that that where content on an old site met an identified user need, we would create new content on GovUK to meet that need, following our style guide written in plain English. And then the pages on the old site that were relevant to that user need would be redirected to the new content. And the other pages on the old sites where we couldn't find any identified user need would be archived. And by archive, in the context of transition, we mean that uh, we would return HTTP 4.10 gone status, and we'd show you a standard page, a bit like a, a standard 404 page, but with some helpful links to get you onto where you might find other things you're looking for. So this is an example of a piece of content on an old site that we couldn't find a user need for, so we archived it. It's a press release from 2010. We don't need to move this content onto GovUK, so this was archived. So since we were writing new content for GovUK, to meet valid user needs, why bother redirecting URLs from the old site? Why not just turn them off completely and forget about them? Well, there are links to all those old sites in search engines, on other websites. Uh, this is a link to DirectGov on the website of Citizens Advice, which is a well-known charity in the UK that provides free and impartial advice to people. Um, this link is still on their site today. Um, charities don't know where to have the resources to be able to update all of their links all over their sites, and we shouldn't expect them to do that. We should be able to keep these links working. There are URLs printed on mugs, on other promotional materials. I don't know what the point of this thing is, but it's there. And on pre-printed stationery, so this is on the back of an envelope, but it could be letters or leaflets in a doctor's surgery. And these printed URLs in particular have to stay working for a really long time. Um, there was a GDS designer who was working with a government department, and this designer wanted to make a small change to the layout of a printed form. And they were told that it would take 16 years to make a change to any form, 
because that's how long it would take the department to get through their stock of pre-printed forms. Um, and the cost of just throwing all those away and starting again is something that is important to a government that is accountable to its taxpayers. And this kind of context is something that like, most startups probably wouldn't need to deal with. Government is special sometimes. Another way that government is special is that people interact with government not out of choice, out of necessity. Um, they're often in difficult times in their lives, in challenging situations. Um, there are real consequences for people's lives if the content that we should be providing is out of date or it's not accessible. And so we need to make sure that users can still get to the information that they need wherever they're coming from, as well as being good web citizens by maintaining working links, because the integrity of the web is important. So GovUK built tools to ensure that we don't just leave users hanging when they visit URLs on those old sites after they've been transitioned. But we're talking about not just a few sites. There were hundreds of them with millions of users. At a high level, a site transitions uh, by the organization that owns that site changing the DNS so that instead of the domain pointing to the old site servers, it changes to point to the CDN that sits in front of GovUK's transition tools. And then we serve the archives or redirects to users. That means that we're handling everything except for the DNS centrally, so departments can end their hosting contracts for those old sites, they can turn off the servers, all they have to maintain is a DNS record. So what do we build? The initial system that we built to do this was called Redirector, and that was used for Direct Govern Business Link and those first 24 departments. And that system was built really quickly in just a few weeks before GovUK launched. The data source for Redirector was lots of really big CSV files of mappings. Mappings are a URL on an old site uh, with the behavior that they should have after transition, where that's a redirect to a new URL or an archive. So those CSVs, there were lots of them, they were all munched together in a particular order to overwrite each other in certain ways with Perl scripts. And then there were make files that generated other make files. And all of that generated a big bundle of Nginx web server configuration. And that was what was deployed to servers to actually serve all those redirects and archives. So this system was built really, really quickly. And it worked. But it had some disadvantages. Changes to mappings could only be made by a few people working within GovUK because they were in CSV files in a Git repository. We restrict access to those. Only certain people are allowed access to our code that gets deployed to production. Uh, and, for, and a Git repo is not the most successful place for non-developers to edit things. So GDS became a bottleneck for maintaining all of those mappings for those first sites. Also, the whole system needed to be deployed periodically for changes to mappings to take effect. So it was difficult to fix a single one quickly if you found that it was broken. And by the time those initial 24 departments had transitioned, it was already generating hundreds of thousands of lines of Nginx configuration, which isn't really how Nginx is intended to be used. Um, it used up a lot of memory on those servers, and it took quite a long time for Nginx to restart because it was having to load so much config into memory. Also, it wasn't super stable, either, I think. Um, so we knew that the system wouldn't scale to the hundreds of sites that we knew were coming with the other 300 organizations that were coming onto GovUK, both in terms of performance technically and also the workflow for maintaining all the mappings. We also learned from those first transitions that mapping is not an exact science. It needs human attention and decision making, and it can't all be automated. It turns out that it's quite difficult to make a list of all of the URLs that exist on a website in the first place in order to work out what you would need to map. There's a few reasons for that. The structure of the old site might have already changed several times in the past. Some of those old sites have been around for 10 or 15 years. They hadn't taken as much care as we were trying to about making sure that all of those old previous URLs redirected. So there were already broken links within the site itself and from other sites onto that. Some of the assets that are served by sites are content, and therefore we need to redirect them, uh, such as PDF publications. But other things like JavaScript or CSS don't need to be mapped. But um, you can't always tell from the file name within a URL what the content type is reliably. Um, there's also some content that some of those sites had published because the organization had a legal obligation to publish that content and make it available and keep it up to date. And so even though there aren't very many people actually viewing those pages, so the URLs show up rarely in server logs or in Google Analytics, 
we still need to move that content onto GovUK and redirect it and make sure that it's available so that we're not breaking the law. Um, we also found that some of the sites were using content management systems that generated really horrible URLs. Um, they would have uh, query strings that didn't indicate what the content on the page would be from what the URL looked like. Um, and um, there were also often many uh, duplicate URLs, multiple URLs generated for a single piece of content, which meant that for, you'd have then multiple URLs that you'd have to map the same way and keep those in sync over time. And so these systems weren't able to actually generate a good list of all of the URLs for the content that they managed. So we needed to combine and curate data from a variety of sources in order to make a good list of URLs that needed to be mapped for a site. And each site setup was a bit different, so it was hard to completely automate that process. It also isn't always easy to decide where to redirect each URL to. We learned really early on that the people who knew the content and the users of the old site best should be making the decisions about where to redirect to. Because you need to understand why users would be going to those old pages to make that decision. And when we were transitioning Direct Govern Business Link when GovUK first launched, we didn't have access to those people. Uh, so I think one person at GDS ended up mapping all of Business Link. And that was really, really hard work for him. It really felt like redirecting with his bare hands. So although we had a system in production that got the job done, we knew there were problems with it, both technical and process problems. And so we had to iterate and build something that would better meet our users' needs. So the team that I was on, built some new applications instead of, to use instead of Redirector for the next 300 organizations that were transitioning onto GovUK. The core of that system is the transition tool, which is a Ruby on Rails application, which users across government can log into to manage mappings for the sites that belong to their organizations. That app writes to a Postgres database, and then we have a separate application called Bouncer, which is a small Ruby rack app that reads from that database, and then when users visit URLs on the old sites, those requests go to Bouncer, and it serves redirects or archive pages to them. So what are the benefits of this new system over the previous one? Well, there are some technical advantages to start with. Changes to mappings are written to a database, and so they're available immediately on the next request to Bouncer for that URL. We don't need to deploy the whole system as developers taking up our time to be able for those changes to go live straight away. Also, these applications scale much better for us than this really large bundle of Nginx configuration. The restart time for an app isn't dependent on the number of mappings that are in the database, and we've already got systems on GovUK for doing zero downtime deploys. And so we can use our usual techniques for scaling applications instead of having to come up with something more custom for the old redirect system. Also, we use Rails a lot on GovUK. We've got something like 80 applications that make up GovUK. The majority of them are Rails, and we have fewer developers than applications, so it's really important to us for our workflow that people can work on different applications, and there's always some context switching, but at least having more things in Rails makes it easier for us to do that. It's much easier for developers to maintain this really custom system of uh, CSVs and Perl and make files that was only understood by the few people who built it. So the new apps are easier for us as developers to maintain and work with, but what about government users? What do they get from this? The transition tool can be used by people in departments to manage all of the mappings for their sites themselves, which means that GDS is no longer a bottleneck to making changes and getting them live. So this is what the main page for searching for and editing mappings for a site looks like in the transition tool. In order to be successfully self-serve, um, transition needs to work for people without them having to understand DNS or HTTP. These are mostly not technical people in departments who are making these changes to sites and mappings. But even though this application is controlling effectively how parts of the internet work, we had to make something that would work for users who didn't have that technical knowledge. So we had to understand their needs in order to build it well. So if we zoom in on that page to see a few examples of how it does that, we try to avoid HTTP terminology where we can in the app. So we say archive and uh, redirect for individual mappings rather than referring to HTTP status codes. Um, and we say that it, a URL for a mapping redirects to a new URL rather than calling it the location, like the header on a 301 response. And with hindsight, it may, may seem surprising, but this shift in mindset took some time for our team 
because we'd had technical people within GovUK maintaining Redirector, and we thought of it as a kind of a technical low-level system, but we needed to adapt how our team thought about this process in order to make the application work better for users. Um, it's also worth pointing out that um, a single mapping will actually handle requests for multiple URLs because we canonicalize URLs both in the transition tool and in Bouncer so that um, in general we are ignoring parts of the URL that wouldn't have made a difference to the content that the user would have seen on the old site. So generally we ignore query strings, we downcase URLs. And that means that there are fewer mappings for government users to maintain and there is more chance that uh, as a person clicking a link on a, to a, 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 one of those old sites after the site has transitioned, the URL that that link is using will match a mapping that is in the database. So you'll actually get to somewhere useful. Our product manager at the time, Dave Mann, wrote a blog post which explains some of the technical terms around transition. And we had feedback from our users that they found it useful to have that context. And so we put it into the app as a glossary and we kept it up to date. No matter how much we try to avoid using those uh, technical terms in discussions around transition, they do still come up because at heart, we are getting organizations to make changes to DNS and they need to understand some of those things. So it was useful for them to be able to have an easily accessible reference point within the application they were using anyway so that they could look up those terms when they came up in discussions and have an understanding of what actually needed to happen. We like to say at GDS that user research is a team sport. And we did user research throughout the process of building the transition tool. At the time, we didn't have a dedicated user researcher on our team. And so Paul Hayes, the front-end developer on our team, did our user research. Um, he would, when people came in from departments into our office to have meetings about transition, he would grab them, sit them down, put the transition tool in front of them, and get them to use it to um, create mappings and maintain their sites. And um, the feedback that we got from his research meant that every few weeks we could build something new, put it in front of users, find out what worked, what didn't, and iterate it. And we continued iterating until our research showed that our users were able to maintain all their mappings. They found it straightforward to use the tool to do what they needed to do for transition. And that was a few months into this year where we were transitioning these 300 organizations. And by that point, some of the biggest ones had already transitioned successfully and some smaller ones, uh, but there were lots more of them to come. And so we could have carried on adding functionality to this application for the rest of that year. And there were still planned features that we'd always assumed that we would need to build. But actually we found that our users didn't need them for example, we'd already managed, we always managed the core configuration of what sites and domains existed within the transition tool and bouncer in YAML files in a repo, which gets imported into transition every hour. And we thought that we would have to build some UI within the transition tool to allow that configuration to be edited there eventually. But actually we realized that editing that configuration does need technical context and peer review. And so we also need to be in control of what domains our tools are handling centrally. So it wasn't appropriate for departments to do that part themselves. And pull requests already give us the workflow that we needed to do that. And I'm just going to point out here that we decommissioned the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. They manage and dispose of nuclear waste. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, but getting back to pull requests, um, like GitHub already controls who has access to write to this repo to update the configuration. Uh, we get peer review with comments on pull requests. We can validate changes to the config with tests that run in our CR environment. And we can see the status of those tests on the pull request before we merge. We didn't need to build a new feature in our application for this. The transition tool already did everything that it needed to do. We'd done the hard work to make it simple by iterating and building only what our users really needed. Another huge advantage of having an application over redirect to the old system is that we can present traffic data in the app to help users create and maintain their mappings. We're enabling them to make decisions based on data. These analytics pages are a really crucial part of the transition tool, especially in the few days and weeks just after sites transition. And we encourage our users to check these pages really frequently. Um, this data gives our users the information that they need to find URLs that they had missed so that they can create mappings for those URLs. And it's also an opportunity to catch missed user needs. If you see after a site has transitioned that something that we had thought we could archive is still getting a really high level of traffic, 
then that indicates that if people are still going to look at it, then perhaps we've missed a user need. We should consider writing new content on GovUK and redirecting that old URL. So the graphs on these pages give an overview of all the data. And then below that, there are tables which show every URL and the number of requests with that status that they're getting. And we use a bar chart within the table to indicate the relative number of requests for each of those URLs. This table shows some URLs that used to be 404ing because they didn't have mappings at the time. And then within the table, we show that when an error is fixed, when there's no mapping there, so it says that it's now redirecting or it's now archived. And then on the right of the table, you can add or edit a mapping for a particular URL. We're presenting this data so that our users can take action on it and fix things. This graph is for a department site, which was one of the earliest ones to transition um, back at really early at the start of the process. And so this graph shows us more than three years of data from January 13 onwards. Um, and this site is a good example of traffic patterns over time. Um, Traffic doesn't actually go down very much after a site transitions. You might think that after the old site just starts redirecting somewhere else, that the traffic would all disappear really quickly. Um, but actually, it goes down a little bit to start with, and it stays stable for, well, about three years after that, so far anyway. So it's really important that we keep these URLs working, we keep all of these tools up and running a long time after these sites have transitioned, so that people can still get to GovUK and find the content they need. You can also see on the graph there, there are occasional really big spikes on just for one day. They're often for just a single URL that gets lots of requests on one day. Um, there's a, a couple of reasons that that might happen. Um, there might be a link to something from a popular news article, say, um, the Ministry of Defense's old website used to have a page about places that they owned that you could hire to use as film locations. Um, and there was a BBC News article about one of those, and so we suddenly got a whole load of hits in one day for that. Or it could just be a bot getting stuck and just like hitting one URL a million times in a day. It's hard often to work out the reasons for it. Um, so if we just look at the six months of the data from the very foot, the start of that graph and zoom in on that. So this site transitioned really early on. This was before we started building the transition tool. And so the data that is shown on these pages comes from processing our CDN log files. And we were storing the logs then, but we weren't displaying this data anywhere. Um, the pink line on the graph is for errors, and green is redirects. And then at the top, the black line there is the total number of requests for URLs in a day. So at the start of the period, the error rate was like five times the number of redirects. We were serving like 50,000 um, 404s in a day compared to about 10,000 redirects, which isn't great because most of our users were getting errors at that point. And then after a while, the error rate suddenly drops. Uh, and then most requests are redirecting, and then it drops again a few weeks later. So this site was managed in redirection at the time, so a deploy of that system would suddenly fix a lot of things at once. But we didn't have this data visible anywhere, so it would take a while to find those URLs that were erroring, work out where they needed to go. This graph is for a different site, which transitioned much later on, uh, and it used the transition tool from the start. And this graph covers just five days, starting on the date that the site transitioned, which is there on the left of the graph. And then on the next day, the pink line there goes up. Um, that was actually mostly just for one URL that was erroring on that day. So we import the data into the transition tool every hour. So users get really quick feedback after their site transitions so they can fix these errors really quickly. So they created a mapping for this URL straight away. And the next day, it's back down to pretty much zero again. Um, you might not be able to read the scale on that graph. There were 100,000 requests for that one URL in that one day we served for 100,000 404s. Um, this site was for the government's organization that regulates medicines for the UK. And they publish uh, information about medicines and drugs which need to be recalled because there were production faults or they're contaminated and they're dangerous for people to take. And um, this URL was an RSS feed for those alerts. And Lots of doctors or other people who work in medicine were subscribed to that to get all that information as quickly as possible. Um, this content is really, really important. And it gets a lot of traffic. And it's really important to redirect these URLs so that we keep them working. And displaying data to our users like this um, enables them to do that. This is what we mean by designing with data. And we enable our users to design with data too. The longer explanation for this design principle says that analytics should be built in, always on, and easy to read. And this is a great example of doing that. 
So what do you see when you visit URLs on old sites after transition? Well, Bouncer serves three types of responses. I've mentioned them all already. Um, most requests are redirected. So if you visit this really long URL on DirectGov now, then instead of seeing this orange DirectGov page, Bouncer redirects you to this page on GovVK. It has got a shorter, cleaner URL. Um, it's a seamless experience for users. They don't really notice Bouncer doing that. We're just getting people to the best place to find that content now. We saw this page earlier on that there was no user need for. If you visit that URL now, you get a page like this. It's been archived. Um, but these archive pages aren't just a dead end for users. Um, there's a link at the top there to the, the last item in the UK's government web archive. And then there's a link to the department's new homepage on GovUK. And at the bottom, there's a link to a contact form on GovUK so that users can give us feedback if they can't find what they were looking for, if they think we should be redirecting them somewhere else. And if you click on that first link to the web archive, you can see that the original content is still available there in that archive. It hasn't completely disappeared from the web. This is an example of a 404 page. And you get one of these if you visit a URL that we don't know about. It might be that um, it really was something that existed. Or like this one, it could just be something random. Uh, but you still get the links here, similar to ones on the archive pages. So you can still get onto GovUK or find other places. The largest phase of transition finished over a year ago now. Um, so like, what's happened since then? Where are we at now? The transition tool and bouncer handle about 800 sites across 1,500 domains. We've got about 500 users um, across well over 300 organizations across government maintaining about 2 million mappings. And bouncer handles about 3, 3 million requests a day across all of those transition sites. There are still lots of domains that keep on being found. It turns out that government doesn't really know what domains and sites it owns. They keep on finding them down the back of the sofa and want to turn them off. But they want to use our tools to redirect them when they find them. Um, since the main phase of transition finished at the end of 2014, um, we've configured about 100 new sites at the request of departments so they can transition them. And looking ahead, transition so far has been about getting every government organization publishing on GovUK and turning off their old main site. Um, but we're starting to look now at all of their other tools um, and other websites that they had, other interactive services, to decide which of those we can also move on to GovUK. So like transition is not actually finished yet. At GDS, we've built tools that users want to use by making decisions based on our design principles. We use these principles really, really frequently when we're deciding what to build and how to build it. And they're a constant reference point for us. They're really at the heart of how GDS works. So this is how we build GovUK and how we do it without breaking the web. To finish, our GitHub organization is called AlphaGov, and all of the repos we've been talking about are there. We're hiring. Come and talk to us if you think this sounds like interesting work. Thanks. Thanks.